Professor Marshall, would you like to agree, disagree with this? You worked on Brillion, you worked on a lot of uh, uh, biomechanical well, measures. While we're passing the uh, microphone to him, so the, you would agree that keratoconus is also a thinning disorder, the cornea thins, okay? Well, so, well, although, no, okay, no. That's, I, we don't know what pr primarily is, but if the cornea thins, if you think about it, there's only a few ways with a, a, a surface can thin in the cornea. So for the cornea to thin, either the anterior surface moves posterior, closer to the posterior surface, but we know that doesn't happen because that would cause flattening, okay? The anterior surface can be stationary and the posterior surface can move anterior, that would cause thinning, or they both can move anterior, but for thinning to occur, the posterior has to move more than the anterior, otherwise you would get thick, thick thickening. So you're a lot more scientific than I am. I'm just mechanical. So from a, a simple shape, mechanical, um, and in all my all the data, the magnitude of the posterior change is always greater than the magnitude of the anterior change. And we looked at that in a group of patients. Uh, I did this work with the group in Peru, where we actually imaged them after they were, had the epithelium removed for cross-linking to see if the uh, epithelial uh, masking compensated for that. And while it did mask some, the posterior magnitude was still greater than the anterior magnitude. So I don't think you look at any one value, but... Well, but these are, so those are patients who were going on to cross -link. Yes, it wasn't so. early. And the same thing with when we look at post-LASIK ectasia. Right. Those are patients, particularly now when we retrospectively call these, and those are patients that probably never had, had surgery to begin with to take that and try to make it predictive. Right. It, it, it does, you know that, when we talk about the same, same thing. Yep. Yep. And well, you did a great lead in about your peer review comments for the talk I'll eventually give. Just, yeah. just um, commenting from the biomechanical viewpoint and the sort of strategic physics, etc. cetera, Brad is absolutely right. The anterior cornea is the um, cornea with the highest biomechanical component, and it's there that X-ray diffraction tells you in keratoconus uh, you're getting structural changes. Uh, nevertheless, when those changes occur, you do seem to get some target recoil from the elasticity of decimase. So front of the eye is probably generating the issue, but you will see some changes in, in, in the back because of those anterior changes. So you don't believe that it starts from the back? No, well, from, from all the studies that we've done, both on the pathology, the X-ray diffraction, and the true biomechanical measurements, the changes we see in keratoconus, even in the earliest stages, are occurring in the That's anterior a very good point. third. Because yes, you, said, you said something about... Yeah, yeah, so in this particular patient, since the maps are so confusing, I would go back to the roots. Because if you look here, I look at the abrometry. I also look for the coma. Here, if you see, the lower order aberration shows a significant cylinder, which is not reflected in your refraction. So if there is a discrepancy there, and if the coma values are higher, I would want to dilate, look at the lens. I would also want to look at the scissor shadow, go back to the roots. And I think that would also give some idea wait for six months, repeat all the tests. If there is no change, then I may go for PRK. Good. Uh, that's what I would do for Good. this Good. I patient. think that, that's the take home point from this case. But one thing I would like to ask Professor Bellin here is, you're looking at, this is your uh, anterior Zernike maps, right? Uh, if I go back to the surface elevation of the cornea back, if there are, if there is uh, inverted comma, a posterior elevation, will you see a more noise on the Zernike here? Again, I'm going to speak out of somewhat ignorance, which I do a lot, um, because I don't use this, but I believe these are, these are anterior-derived Zernikes. But you, you have this click button here. Okay, so again, I don't... I'm so, wavefront abrasion, cornea back, the fourth oh, one. Oh, okay, please. okay, sorry. So what do you, do you think that if there is a real elevation, this abrasion should be higher? <coughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, the, it would, the aberration would not necessarily be higher because I'm assuming they compensate for the change in the optical interface between the, ant, you know, the air cornea versus cornea aque aqueous. But again, this is not a map I routinely use. I'm assuming the bottom one is the total corneal ab uh, aberration. The bottom one is wavefront aberration cornea. That is the total. Whole thing. Yeah. But so that would be, I assume, you know, you could compare that one to the front. But if I go so by uh, what uh, somebody showed yesterday, if there is uh, an early endothelial changes uh, happening in this, will this wavefront aberration be different? Well, th these are derived completely differently than the, than the eye trace. These are all based on a reference, uh, on an elevation reference sphere as opposed to a true schiosca. Which is why I don't use them. I agree with yeah. you. That's why I said I use the one that, that whatever laser you have in the U.S., we have these. I don't use these for that exact, exact reason. I want to ask a question. The terminology is completely wrong. It's not wavefront, right? It can't be wavefront because it's not the, the right coming in yeah, and out. I've it's not. Brad and I, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we don't. It's, it's really a wrong terminology there. So they, they, from elevation, they derive curvature, and from curvature, they derive wavefront. So it's like it, it many derivations. Be but it's the same thing. A placido it, can't do this. None of them can do this. You, it's you also need, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it should just be aberrations and. It, it, it should be elevation-based aberrations, honestly, yeah, is what it should say. Yeah, not the wavefront aberration. Right, yeah, that's right. And that's, again, why I really... There's something they should change it. there. It's the wrong uh, optical terminology, I guess. Any other questions? So I have a very basic question to the... Because you know, we have a good faculty, and for the interest of all those people sitting behind, uh, it, this is too much data, you know, for anybody who starts a refractive practice or is looking at it. And uh, comparing both the machines, Pentacam has been the gold standard. You know, most practices have it, and Cirrus is catching up. Why don't we have a uh, you know, page like we have in the Cirrus and I, somebody can put up the keratoconus summary on the Cirrus. Uh, they ha look at a lot of score and then they classify. Keratoconus, no keratoconus, treated. Versus Pentacam where a lot of it is you know, left to interpretation also. Okay, be because we'll, we use the bad display. The bad display wasn't designed to diagnose keratoconus. It was designed to, in some degree, do a risk analysis to separate normal from, we all know if you have keratoconus, you shouldn't have refractive surgery. That's not the diagnostic dilemma or clinical dilemma. The dilemma is on those patients that we think are normal, whether they are at high risk or not. Um, for plus, C plus, I will tell you, I don't know that any machine that, can, that currently can tell me whether something is keratoconus or not, unless it's so obvious that I don't need the machine to begin with. And that's gonna be my talk later today also, which hopefully Brad will like. <laughs> The one thing good about the Cirrus part is that it, uh, I mean, it also gives you a, uh, it has a placido and uh, it gives you a uh, shine flow imaging. So many of their uh, indices out here, if you look at the curvature asymmetry, front, back, BCV, uh, all these things are a mix of, I think, uh, all this. Right, Vaitish? So, definitely, sir. So, do you want me to explain them? Uh, in so visual? curvature is straight out of the placido and the elevation is out of the shine fluke. So I asked them if they can give a curvature out of the shine fluke as well and they refused. They said it's not reliable. So that's uh, completely wrong. And people think placido gives you curvature. It doesn't. It's still a comp computed number on placido. Placidos measure slope. Slope is the, f curvature is the first derivative of uh, slope and it's the second derivative of elev elevation. And we've done I can call up on this and show you. We've done side-by-side -side comparisons. The curvature maps between the two are clinically identical, except for, and it's, this is any shine pool device, will give you much better coverage of the cornea, because placebo is limited to about 60%, and it also is not sensitive to surface abnormalities. So you get data regardless of tear film. Exactly. That's why I asked them if you can show side-by-side, -side because they have a shine yeah, look, I and they have a... Topography, they should show both side by side so we get the real but picture. That's what's very interesting in this. Both are speaking the same language. Yeah. And you can see this, uh, what happens in Cirrus is if you can just put that, uh, that black band there, anything black band being in that green. green zone out there seems to be okay. But the only thing which is abnormal is the curvature asymmetry front, which is just in that, uh, the yellow zone. So, so it's an easy map to interpret for a, you know, layman. Absolutely. Wish, you know, so you can see that... Uh, there is a lot of values, but if you sit down and start looking at it, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I don't think they never, I don't think anybody has built a bad topographer. Yes, ma'am. Exactly what uh, Dr. Rupal ma'am said, you wait, and if it's stable, 
and you feel it's very stable uh, for the sake of uh, for your mental satisfaction maybe a PRK the patient had a higher power good ACD and ICL so I, I have a question no. for Dr. Bellin yes that's what he said the, the, the the, the debate was that uh, do we really consider post elevation as something which is abnormal? Because it's been here we have been we have been very very uh, uh, very very hyper about anything on the posterior cone. You know, posterior surface is for us a big. And there are there are times when I've seen uh, patients advise or done cross linking just for a posterior cone, assuming that this is going to be an anterior uh, at some point of time. Can we go to the Can I again just quickly someone asked I'd like to quickly show so these are side by side uh, same patient done literally minutes apart the image on the left is a uh, Humphrey standard placido the one on the right is the Penicam and these are curvature maps and what you'll notice I'll flip through them real quickly other than the, the shine flug and again this is not necessarily a pentacam this is true for any of the shine flugs the coverage is better you won't get the dropout but clinically the information is identical and you can see here again just the amount of coverage is much better and you don't get the loss of data and we did this also let's see again clinically they're identical and we did it with the Magellan and you'll see exactly the same thing here it's left and sorry here it's up up and down not left and right but again, you'll see it's clinically the same information. The next case we want to discuss is uh, uh, the concept of, uh, you, you did bring it up very briefly yesterday, the concept of a small white to white, small eye, and the issue with topographers and all these parameters becoming abnormal. So yesterday you also mentioned that Oculus is looking at a database for small eyes uh, versus big eyes. So question I want to ask uh, Prof. Randleman is, do you think that the small eyes have a different type of a topography pattern, both abnormal and abnormal compared to a bigger white to white? <coughs> I, I don't know. I haven't actually looked into that. Um, my guess is the patterns are not so different but the indices are always going to be based on a on a certain reference surface and those will therefore change um, I, I'm much more of a uh, I try to be an objectively subjective reviewer rather than an indice based reviewer uh, for those types of reasons because you can flip things around scales and whatnot you, you do have to get uh, a very standard approach to your own device and mapping, make sure that you're always getting the same settings and information. Uh, but, but I don't have a good answer for that. I think that's something that should be looked at. Dr. Marshall, do you have an answer for that? <laughs> no, I, I was just going to make a, a comment that, you know, the, the, all the discussions this morning has highlighted the problems of analyzing shape and reducing shape by a number of different types of algorithms in different instrumentation giving you different answers, etc. The real issue here in relation to keratoconus and, and the cornea as a whole is the, um, what we really need and what we will have very shortly is a strain map of the whole system. And remember that this is a dynamic system and all these photographs we've seen here are static, freezing pictures of, of something which is actually dynamic and moving the whole time. And recent studies have shown that there is a huge amount of movement around the limbus, which actually gives some of the anomalies that we're beginning to see. So a, a real-time strain map in milliseconds is not too far away. So that would give us the answers in relation to a lot of the questions we're answering. Um, how does the biomechanics in different locations relate to the sort of pictures we currently have uh, of curvature changes and what we're really interested in is the dynamic objective measurement. Buran's not going to give us that. Buran will give us an image but it'll take forever to do a full map of the cornea. It'll probably take about two hours which is totally impractical. But interferometry will give you that measurement within a few milliseconds. 
Just wait. Invite me back next year and I may show you some great pictures. You get the white behind? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, based on the discussion that we are currently having, I have a question for Dr. Bellin. So uh, sir, you told us that uh, bad D is like a risk stratification score. And uh, you have a nine point, uh, based on nine parameters, you have a regression which gives you a bad D. And uh, you told us that if instead of looking at the cornea head on, if you look at it from a different angle, obviously the inferior or superior may look, uh, may look relatively steeper or flatter, which you told, you showed us. But there are several cases where we have, for example, there is an inferior steepening because from Rabinovitz criteria, we have inferior steepening to be one of the early uh, signs of keratoconus, like where the criteria was more than 1.1 diopters of inferior superior asymmetry. And we have, in several cases, we have an inferior steepening, but only if there is a displacement of the thinnest point from the center according to the bad D score or there is an associated posterior elevation and uh, anterior elevation change in that point, we do consider the bad D turns positive. But as in these cases we have, we, do, we definitely have, we are not looking at it from a different uh, position, we are looking at it head on and it's centered and we have an inferior steepening. But bad D still turns, bad D is still negative because bad D is not incorporated the uh, concept of having an inferior superior asymmetry, which is separately given in the TKC uh, screening criteria. Uh, so do you think that has to be added into the bad D scores? Partly what you said is, is correct. Uh, and, and that is, we don't look at inferior steepening, but at least in, I don't know, it's probably like 10,000 patients that we've looked at so far, uh, the, the inferior steepening w will be sensitive without being specific. And the same thing I showed you, we, we can produce it in a normal shape. Um, the eyes that, and I, I, I have ex samples of that to show here, uh, matter of fact, why don't we just call it up, where, so this is, Is there a reason why we're not? Okay. Yeah, it's here. So this is inferior steepening. Yes. That's the, uh, and this will be the other eye. Even more so. Now granted, there are a lot of people who will look at that and say, well, principal meridians are orthogonal. But if we look at the... Uh, is there a way you can tell us, how do you look at the displaced apex? Because you, you spoke about displaced apex. Well, right here, you see this? Notice this is the normal elevation astigmatic pattern. You see how it looks slightly dragged down? That's why you see that. So again, this is the same thing you're taking. So you go to the elevation map? Well, again, if I go to the bed and I, you know, I'll eat myself if it's not normal, it should be normal. And it is. Matter of fact, this is really normal. It's a minus number. <laughs> and there again, you can see a little bit better, even more so on the posterior surface, how it's a normal astigmatic pattern that's not aligned with the visual axis. And if we look at, that's the anterior surface. Well, I have to change color scales on this, so I just won't, but. If we can go back to the map again. Which one? The, the this one. Well, that's tangential. It won't, pe most people use. Okay, axis. just hold on here. Uh, I'd like to ask the refractive surgeons here, how many, on, how many of you would do a LASIK on this patient. If you lift your hands up. I mean, with if everything else is normal again. Yeah, let's assume everything else is normal. Yeah. But this case. What is the angle, Kappa? Uh, in this is up? difficult to make, but I will give you X Y coordinate is plus two nine plus two zero, pupil center. It's so it's, it's, it's okay. decentered. Yeah. Or is it is it yeah. normal? Yeah. Is it normal or is it? It's normal. Plus. Let's take it normal. I mean, this is a topography you get, 25-year-old, minus, minus 2. Would you, would you do it on that patient? <laughs> <laughs> so you feel if the problem is the scale? No, it's a false positive. It's not, Brad, it's a, what yes, you, you can't do, Professor? Well, so again, in my practice, I'm doing epithelial mapping on most. This patient is most likely going to have epithelial thickening in that region because as what Michael said is everything else looks very normal. The thickness uh, is well centered. There's, there's nothing else on any other map. Um, I don't, uh, what we, what we do, uh, 
unfortunately and frequently, is we take a presumption and then we back it all the way back to the primary thing. So in fear steepening in and unto itself with nothing else going on is likely not pathologic. Um, I, I do agree, uh, as John and Michael said, that at, at some point in keratoconus there are changes in the posterior surface. But what people have done with that is they've said, okay, the very first thing is going to be an isolated posterior surface elevation. And if so if I see one little thing there with the rest of the map normal, it's normal. Uh, and, and what has happened with the ORA 10 to 15 years ago and now the Corvus is that, as, as John says absolutely correctly, what we need is a biomechanical measurement of the cornea. So one comes out and then people say, well, that's the real answer and now I want to ignore everything else. And, and those are all the, the problems with this. So I, I think one thing in isolation is rarely ever going to be truly pathologic. And Dr. Brad, you've heard me said, do you think that. you'll do a smile Don't on Don't overread individual parameters. It's just, yeah. Uh, Inferior, inferior steepening. Ma'am, one minute. Ma yeah, infer inferior steepening, I would do an epithelial map, check the epithelial map. Let's assume it's normal. Perfectly epithelial. normal. If there is an asymmetry with a normal angle kappa, I would not go ahead. You'd not? I would not go ahead with, I would probably do an ICL, I would not go ahead with a corneal refractor surgery. Because the inferior steepening. Is again, what is the medical legal implication? Because anybody can develop a ectasia. So if the patient develops ectasia and the patient comes to Rohit, he said, it's very clear inferior steepening, this eye shouldn't have been touched. Exactly. So there is that aspect as refractive surgeons, we also have to consider other than other important aspects. And of the raise of hands, how many would do a PRK for this? The same, oh, he's changed the case, but uh, let's assume it's same case. I think what, do you th what would you do with, what would you do with that, that map? Sir? What would you do with that pic picture? So Brad, will you, uh, excuse me if I wasn't, at ASCRS, you were speaking at the session with Damien or not? I don't know if, okay, so I brought this up because there was a huge discussion of whether keratoconus can exist with superior steepening. The, the question is, my, can? My name was used in vain there, that's why you're remembering <laughs> it. Uh, because Doyle brought up uh, a lecture uh, Doyle was there, from yes. 10 yeah, years okay, ago okay, you're right, you're and right. disagreed with me. Um, I do believe that superior keratoconus can exist. I do not believe that this is necessarily superior keratoconus. I don't have enough information. Well, okay, so let's look at, um, I'm going to show you two quick patients. Obviously no ectasia. Right, I'm not concerned about that. And a completely normal bad. And now let's... Uh, let me actually, sorry, because this can give you the answer before, ah, shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> uh, see, I'm just going to put back what we had on before for a second. Okay, now I'm going to show you another patient. Oh, come on. Okay, so that one even looks worse. Okay, but notice the difference. So this is another superior steepening. And the discussion there was whether keratoconus can ever exist with superior steepening. And now if we look here, notice the difference. Yeah. Huge posterior ectasia. And Why do you think there is superior steepening and a posterior ectasia, inferior? Well, if you look over here, again, notice how this looks. And it's not a lot, but it looks slightly dragged up. And again, don't, I don't overanalyze curvature maps just for that reason. Um, but this but clearly sir, we find is highly ab abnormal. We find these patients who have an inferior elevation alone, uh, sorry, inferior steepening alone with bad day being normal, when people who do contra, when they do a scan, they find that there is a significant coma in these patients. 
and with the wavefront optimized treatment, they would not do as well as with the topogated treatment because the coma is not at risk. So how can we call them normal corneas just because bad D is normal? Well, okay, those are two, two different things. Getting a less than optimal result from refractive surgery is very different than saying you have, based on whatever data analysis you use to decide your ablation profile, is very, very different than saying you have an abnormal cornea. Uh, Dr. Those Bell, are Dr. Rishi, different. you have a question? Uh, that map which you just showed with the superior steepening, my guess is if you were to do an epithelial thickness map, in that area you would have a lot of thickened epithelium and that's what's giving you that superior steepening because of that inferior uh, cone. Can the lid, which, it, it, for example, if you have a thicker lid, and it, sorry, can, can that really create, you want to see that? Can the lid have this effect on, uh, on that epithelium, the epithelium there to create that change? Or a so, Yeah. Or a Yeah. So there's one more. Uh, yes. I think there's another point to be made, and, and um, I do like the anterior curvature, and, and I do use it, uh, and, and I use it much differently than, than uh, Michael does. That said, I do not like to have um, only a placido analysis in, in this day and age. I, I don't feel that that isolated anterior curvature map only is sufficient unless you're going to be ultra, ultra conservative. Um, if this is the only thing I have, I cannot say it's a variant of normal unless I have all the other maps. So if I only have a placido here, I have to say no, even though this is not an abnormal cornea. And if you have epithelial thickening, it's like or, or epithelial mapping, it's likely thicker. If you have thickness and elevation, they look normal. Um, so, so that's sort of my caveat there. The last question from this session is, when you showed me a posterior elevation of the same patient, so Elev posterior elevation of the same patient is inferior, but the anterior curvature map sh is superior. Is it a compensatory artifact here? Oh, the abnormal the yeah. Oh, sorry, okay. The same patient. Go to the same yeah, patient. Yeah. No, that, you know, I mean, the abnormal one. Because if there is an elevation anteriorly, that the same area should show the posterior elevation. And your elevation is superior but your post elevation is inferior back elevation why do you think this is happening here because usually when you see an inferior cone you always see the inferior yeah. elevation i think we may not know the answer to that yeah i don't i, I, I think that, that i think that is beyond our knowledge of the ectatic cornea probably any but, questions? But I would not rule them in just because it doesn't seem to match what we think. Yeah. Rohit, the previous patient whom we rejected, that minus 2, 1, showed a totally normal pentacan maps. It's minus 2. The, the previous patient. The false had, positive. I mean, the they, false positive. The issue uh, was with the inferior uh, yes, steepening. Yes, but then, then what is the point of having all these indices to your uh, disposal if you're going to depend only on that map? Rubel. It's more of, that's what he said, it's like, it's just not the indices there, it's more like how you... No, you but don't you have as, 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 um, asymmetrical bow tie patterns? That's why you go in for such indices and, and other uh, more information, so that you can conclude whether this is normal or not. So if you look at the pentacam maps of that particular patient, all the bad values, everything is normal with no posterior elevation, nothing, then how do we interpret? That's what I it still remains an enigma then. See, that is always that amount of fear to let go of something which we are all been part of. For example, anterior curvature yes. map has always been part of our DNA. And till we let go that, if you want to let go, that is always going to haunt us. For example, the curvature maps, see, if you want to, the, for example, the next generation who are going to come are probably never going to look at the curvature maps. They're only going to look at the elevation and then they, they don't have it. We are in that transition zone where we use the Placido. We, we, we believe there is an inferior lazy eight uh, shape and that gets stuck in our mind forever. 
Well, I, so I hope that we don't throw it away. We don't. I, I hope we don't move to the point where we don't, we don't throw them away. Yeah, so it's but, never going to be part of. But what we did know when we started looking at ectasia after LASIK is you would see a patient with inferior deepening who developed ectasia after LASIK, and another surgeon would show you the same type of pattern that did not. And likely those two corneas are very different because there's additional information. It doesn't mean that anterior curvature is not valuable. What I do think has happened is that people have completely gone away from it. Um, my sort of uh, pessimistic uh, or curmudgeonly take on indices is the reason they're in there is because they sell machines, because people love them. They love a thing that lights up yellow or red. They love all these little things, and that's why, and, and, and the machine with the most indices tends to sell best. It doesn't mean it's scientifically validated. It doesn't mean that it's actually the best way to look at it, but that's what happens all the time, is that people stop looking at the overall cornea, and they look at one or two different indices. So I think that's, you know, be, because of that, and until or unless they're very clearly validated, you have to take them with a grain of salt. And I, I would agree with you, and that's why when someone asked earlier about, they like one machine because it says yes or no. I will never develop a map that will say yes or no, because you can't. I mean, there's no way to do that. Right. And the problem really is, as we get better and better at screening our patients, and I know you'll probably agree with this, it becomes harder and harder to validate what you're doing, because you would need such a, it's like, you know. A million the, patients. Yeah, it's like the European endophthalmitis study, which was amazing because of the volume of patients. That's more common than post lasik ectasia. You'll never, all I can say really for the bad is at the moment, and I, I want to bring it up, I get zero money for the development of that software. I get nothing for it. So it's not like I'm, um, it has stood this test of time, and that's probably the best thing we can say at the moment. You need an agent. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Any last question? <laughs> he says it's a superior care to Kunis. Well, I don't, know if, I don't think this one works. I think this is a normal one. So this is just a the last question? Comment? I think, I think there's a new law of refractive surgery. The more number of equipment you have, the less number of patients you treat. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had a great discussion on, uh, yes. Increased. That's, I think he answered. Yeah, it. but percentage wise, I just want to know from I the I think we all stalwarts. share a percentage, then we'll probably will get it. I think it'll be nice to, I think, to end the session by uh, taking a vote. Let's say all these kind of borderline cases. How many people actually would do a PRK extra compared to a fake I think that'll be a good, uh, I think, uh, PRK extra. <laughs> So uh, for people who do on borderline cases like so, a PRK extra, can we have a raise of hands? Okay, raise of hands for who would do a picky coil. It has to be a combination of factors. I mean, yeah. right from the age of the patient, the amount of refractive error, and uh, the extent of uh, abnormality. Let's, Obviously, let's consider, consider about 25 years being the average and uh, the fake kick in terms of anterior chamber depth is perfect. It seems very ideal compared to a PRK extra. A refractive error? Uh, even from, it doesn't matter, three to seven, whatever. We move on to the. Can we have a raise of hands for fake kick IOLs? Uh, okay. And PRK extra again? Yeah, yeah. Just a plain why, why, why would you cause so much of pain to the patient <laughs> when you have an option which is safe, yeah. which you can confidently do and is almost a painless procedure? Yeah. Why would you do something which causes yeah. pain, which is going to be more difficult, where you have a lot of other issues? Yeah. I also totally agree on the fake I mean, but uh, and, Dr. Roth has devised… Patients, I mean, the whole, uh, approach, the whole approach to refractive surgery is you decide what is good for the patient. Yeah. Not that the patient comes and asks you for a PRK for a or treatment. a smile yeah. or, okay, my friend had it. So I tell them, okay, when you come here, I have 25 years of experience, so I will decide what's best for your eyes yes. and then do it. And when you have an option, you can always choose a fake IOL. Yeah. 
whenever the cornea is abnormal, Makes there sense. is no need to reject the patient. Yeah. You are so not a true. suitable candidate. You tell them, okay, I will see if you are suitable for refractive surgery or not. Yeah. Actually, totally uh, do agree with uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh that I full, I mean, I too would go for a fakey chiral. But I think Dr. Rohit has designed a beautiful uh, thing where actually, which I think in the further presentations they'll show you how yeah, to handle afternoon, pain management and yeah, to afternoon, prevent haze. Afternoon, I think. So I think. We have the afternoon. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be doing Yes, sir. Later. Yeah, I would appreciate it if you can summarize at the end of each such session what are the take home points because there have been so much discussion. And briefly, if we can summarize what are the take-home points, it will be beneficial to everybody over here. The question is, uh, one take-home point we can get is that posterior elevation only, all the time, is not something where we should label them as a keratoconus. That's the first point. The second point is, you look at the map in total, not just one indices, on from any machine, whether it's a bad D or a Pentacam or a Cirrus or a Galilei, you look at it uh, from your perspective. And there is always a matter of experience, what you have seen in your life, because we learn from mistakes. And the best lesson you know is from your mistakes. And you have done something which had a type of topography and you, that patient ended up badly, then you know that that is the pattern you should avoid. And uh, superior keratoconus can also exist, but the, still the question is, why do you have an elevation on the top and why do you have a post elevation in the back, which doesn't make any sense. Like uh, Professor Randleman said, we don't know today, but one day we'll find an answer why there is a difference. Any elevation, any curvature elevation, you need to define this elevation, the curvature changes in relationship to an epithelial map. An epithelial map, the issue with the epithelial map is sometimes uh, you know, you're just looking at what, five millimeters uh, of eight millimeters of it. So if you have an epithelial map, there is no huge elevation, no huge change, then you can, uh, you can take it as such something that's normal. But if there's a huge change of the thickness, then that probably could give you an idea that there is a change in the curvature. So, and Madam said, uh, the most difficult decision today is not making a decision on a topography, it's about even in our country now, we worry about the medical legal aspect of it. If the patient goes today and in the court of law, who is going to defend or who is going to fight on what? If the, some, the, the, oppo, the patient says that the inferior steepening was higher and the test book says even today that is the inferior superior elevation is the standard of care which you should follow and we have not done that and you say that that is not the standard of care, I use a different one. It's your voice against the other. So this is, and again, I don't think we can have a clear consensus on this, but this is all we can derive from this. And a smaller cornea with a smaller white-to-white -white diameter is definitely an issue with many, many indices. And we have seen that all our indices completely change when you have a smaller corneal volume. And your white-to-white -white of 10 with a thickness of 500 completely differs from white to white of 11.5 with the thickness of 500 and whatever, the same thickness. So if you use white to white is a very important factor in looking at an elevation because most of us use that only when you're looking at an ICL just for the sizing. But personally, uh, I think Oculus, he said yesterday that Oculus is looking at uh, parameters also to look at that and these are the take home points for today's use of topographies. And more and more we do, the less number of patients we get because we have to screen out a lot of them. But the most important thing is we do most of the time, even though our gut says that it is normal and we can do a LASIK on even that, like you said, why don't you do a LASIK? The fear is all about what if it goes wrong and if I had to stand in that other side of law, what really happens? Have I answered your question? Thank you.